going to start introducing myself. My name is Mehmet Bocek. Uh, it's not really hard. It's not easy to remember. Uh, I just tell him, call me Go Check. Go and check. <laughs> yeah, sometimes they try to make fun of me. Sorry. Um, I did my bachelor's and master's in teaching chemistry, and currently I'm working at Harmon Science Academy in Lublin. Last year I taught chemistry and regular chemistry and pre-AP pre chemistry, and this year I'm teaching uh, middle school science, physics, and forensic science. So, it all blends in after a while. All right, um, I'm sure some of you might have gone over the abstract, but I thought it would be a good idea to cover it again. So in our modern high schools, there is a great lack of integration of STEM classes. Even though some high school teachers do a great job turning their classes into a learning environment where hands-on based learning and STEM activities are promoted. So what we have is that kids, they learn about biology, physics, and chemistry. And these hands-on activities, they're great. I mean, I'm teaching physics. I use those activities. They're great. And kids, they like it. They love it. But the problem is that when they become a high school seniors, there's very little option for any other science class. So in our school, they either take environmental science or forensic science. When you look at the nature of environmental science, it leans towards more of chemistry and biology. But there's very little options of technology, integration of technology, math, or engineering. However, with forensic science, you get to go, you get to cover all those areas. So that's something I really liked about after um, deciding, deciding to teach forensic science. And it can bring all those fields together. Now, the title of the presentation was Professional Application of STEM. Now, I talked to some of my colleagues when I was doing the presentation, preparing it. And what I noticed was that it, for some, it is kind of confusing. So I thought it would be a good idea to divide it into two, um, two categories and ex start explaining that. All right, so professional application, what I meant was that we have two categories for that. First, achieving college and career readiness, and the second one is integration of STEM fields. Now the abstract talks about integration of STEM fields, but there's also great opportunities for, for kids to get ready for college and career. So, for that, I've been utilizing field trips and integration of STEM fields, forensic science, I mean, you start studying it and it has unlimited amount of hands-on activities, experiments. I'm sure you all watched CSI before and I mean, they've been going for 10 seasons and every season has like 25 episodes, so that's more than 200 episodes and they still come up with new techniques, I mean, it's just crazy. And when you teach forensic science, you got these thousands of techniques that you can utilize and it becomes really hard to choose to go with which would one. So, so let me start with achieving, uh, achieving college and career readiness. The field trips. Most of what I've seen so far is most of most schools, they have field trips, but when you have field trips and you go with a hundred students, it's really hard to get students excited about something that you're out there and it's really hard for them to learn the science of that field trip because we had field trips to um, Carlsbad Caverns in New Mexico and I had more than 20 students and you try to explain how the caves were formed not that easy because it's just random science for them but for forensic science kids these field trips they present great opportunities about what kind of career options they can go after, the paths that they can go after. So, the first one was Lubbock Police Department. And the second one was Institute for Forensic Science at Texas Tech University. And we scheduled another field trip at um, DPS Crime Laboratory Services in Lubbock. And the last two field trips, they will be about the medical examiner dead bodies. So, that will require another extra permission slip for me. <laughs> and the last one, it will be, I guess, the grand finale mm -hmm. is the FBI Dallas field office. It will, that, will, that takes some time. I'm still working on this too. 
examiner's office is that's not that it's it's kind of easy because it's just right out there. But FBI Phil's office, but I've been working on it for for a month. There is nothing yet. So trying to contact five people at a time. Mm -hmm. Even with Institute for Forensic Science, I've contacted five different professors who are department heads of five different faculties, mm -hmm. and you expect to get to to get something, but it takes time. So. And most of these institutions, they don't have outreach programs. The FBI, we all know FBI has that, but Institute of Forensic Science, they didn't have it. Lubbock Police Department, they have it, but it's for middle schoolers. They don't really have it at the level that I actually desire to see. And Crime Laboratory Services, again, their outreach program was very limited, so you you have to call in, you have to send emails, just keep bothering them until they cave in, and they say, <laughs> just come in, we'll have you. <laughs> All right, so one of the things that I've seen with these field trips is that our school is tied to one school. Last year, I used to work at Houston in a big high school, and after moving to Lubbock, what I've seen was that the student profile, socioeconomic speaking, was really low. So you look at these kids, they come from very impoverished households. They live in the worst side of the town. And for them, a trip to Lubbock PD will mean that they get their hands cuffed. So, seeing that they can actually be part of the PD and they can do some good for the community that they're part for, they're part of, it was a eye opening for some of the kids. And I wasn't actually expecting that. So that was kind of surprising for me. And our kids, we have 100 free, 100 per percent free breakfast and lunch. Before that, it was 95 percent. So. <laughs> The administration they decided to go with just 100 percent, and our students 78 percent Hispanic, a little bit of white and African American kids, but mostly Hispanic kids. I mean, you would see kids coming in school with just slippers on. It's really sad. But so this class, I mean, it's really a great tool for them. All right, let me talk about this Institute of Forensic Science as they say. This institution is only for grad students grad school. So they you don't really major in forensic science. You major in one of the sciences and then you go on to specializing on forensic science to be a forensic science expert. But the science fields that you can go, it can be chemistry, you can major in chemistry, biology, genetics, it all works out. You can even major in IT, then be a forensic science expert in IT. I'm sure you'll see in some of the shows where they recover information um, from hard drives that are burned, yeah. So they need experts on that too. Now, did I know about this before? No, because I mean, you don't. There is very little training options for forensic science, so it's kind of self. You just go with self-taught. All right. So the institution, what they had is first they showed us the specific investigation techniques they specialize on. Apparently, they specialize on bones and. You can actually see bones where you had um, different various like chef's knives, different knives and axes go through. So you can look at those and they have these really advanced microscopes where they look into those uh, marks in more detail. They also specialize on, on tire tracks and footprints. And apparently they're also training the lo local PD and local law enforcement officers. And so for them, Having high school kids, it wasn't even something they, that's what they told me, it wasn't even something they actually thought before, because the only people they, that they come in either deputies, officers, or grad students. So they actually thanked me for showing, kind of letting them see what kind of outreach opportunities they can have, so that was kind of really good. So off the track, in order, let me explain what this is, the CSI effect. So after learning about this, I actually made it into part of my class, CSI Tech. It's really funny. So they have, they talk about three different, um, one, I guess one advantage and two disadvantages of CSI Tech. One is that, the one of the positive aspects is that you get kids engaged already. They watch Green's Anatomy, they watch Bones, CSI shows, so they all they already come classroom engaged, so they like it anyways. 
But the downside, you get the criminals. You actually educate the criminals. They learn about how to remove the blood stains, which I will show later on. Not that easy, actually. So they learn about how to remove DNA evidence, how to remove fiber evidence. They learn about that. And there's even some cases where a single mom turns into an investigator, like it was one of the cases that we covered during class. She turns into an investigator because the local PD actually didn't really care about his rape accusations. And she actually finds the evidence and everything. And at the end, she gets the guy convicted. Mm -hmm. And she was talking to, uh, to the TV, and she was actually telling me, I learned everything from CSI. Uh, so it's good for good people, but when you, talk, when you think about bad boys, not good. And, the, something that I haven't heard before was that the problems that they go through in court of law. You have jurors, even judges, asking for the exact, waiting for, expecting to see that um, crisp picture that they've seen in CSI. No, not going to happen. And they think that DNA um, examination will come out in two days. Not going to happen. It, it takes at least a month. And if you live in a city like Lubbock is actually, Lubbock is advantageous because have, we have Texas Tech, but we have um, Odessa close to us. If you live in a small town like that, then you have no laboratories. So who are you going to do your DNA examination? You send it to another city. It takes months. I mean. Then these experts, they were telling us that. Um, the judges, they were like, well, that, and, and this is literally. I've seen this study on this TV show. Can't you just do that? <laughs> No, 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 really. So, this is what they're dealing with right now. All right, let me see. So, Lubbock PD, Lubbock PD was less about college readiness, but more about career options, because we all know that if you want to work at the local police department and be a deputy, you don't really have to go to college. Most towns, they just need to go to academy, and after that, you're done. You're good to go. But this, so this was well more about career options, and Lubbock PD. I mean, they had great people. Um, the surgeon that they that took care of us, he was great, and he showed us because kids they come from again impoverished households, so they see the police as enemy. So this was an eye-opening ex uh, experience for them. They talk about how you can become a cop. They talk about the regular daily life schedule of a um, police officer. And they actually had us visit 911 room. So we have seen operators responding calls coming from all around town. And apparently, they are looking for people to work at 911 too. And they are looking for all kinds of people. So, and we also visited the jail. Thanks God, it's not in use anymore. They just stopped using it like three years ago, but the conditions were not that good. So we wouldn't want to spend a day in there. It was really bad. And some people were talking about ghost stories and stuff. So. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, so that was the field trips and college and career readiness. Now, let's go back to the integration of STEM fields. They learned, like I told you before, they learned about physics, chemistry, biology, they also cover these fields, anthropology, anatomy. But the problem is that you're done with biology, learn, you learned about anatomy. Nobody's going to talk about anatomy and chemistry. They don't. They can, but they don't. In physics, again, they don't. It's not part of the curriculum. So you're a freshman, you learn biology, you learn about anatomy and anthropology, then you're done. For three years, there's nothing. Unt unless you want to... Um, be an expert on this field, you go major or minor in it, then you get to learn about anthropology. So after that, that information they acquired, it becomes, kind of in their perspective, useless. However, with forensic science, you help them remind those information that they learned in sophomore year, freshman year. And again, with technology part, they have to use, they, they need to use advanced microscopes, they need to install the software, have everything going, I'm not helping. I just give them the software and everything, laptop, microscope, 
figure it out. I'm not gonna do it for you. As a freshman, they can't really do it because they're always struggling about the concept of some of them struggling about concept of um, microscope. So you can't really have a biology teacher try to teach them about the software, how to install it, because that's not a part of the curriculum. But with forensic science, you can do that part of the curriculum. That's one of the upsides. All right. Now. I'm going to go over the activities, the experiments that we've, we've done so far, and try to connect those into previous science courses that they learned before. So this was the very first experiment we did, basic fingerprinting. It's actually something you can actually, you, you, you can have middle schoolers do, I mean, it's really easy. What they do, you just have to graphite, grab it all against that, and then the science part comes in when they try to determine the pattern. With middle schoolers, I've done this with the middle schoolers, but you can't really go into advanced patterns, but you would have loops, whirls, stuff like that, but you can't really do that with middle schoolers. But with forensic science kids, they're seniors, they're supposed to go into detail. So I looked into FBI's classification list, and they actually have a small booklet, and that booklet has um, some, that booklet has FBI's preferred method of investigation for fingerprints and it's all in detail and everything and they have to go through that. And again, this is one of the experiments that you can do at home. So the fingerprints all of, um, mm -hmm. of the food that you just left last night, someone took it so you can just lift the fingerprints. Blame your sister brother. <laughs> Properties of black light. Now, I got black light in the last 10 minutes. I'll try to pass this over. And I would ask you to have the black light go over your clothes, mm -hmm. and it will show you the stains that you never think <laughs> was there. <so. laughs> when actually I had this in class, I had to make sure that I was totally clean <laughs> because after the students turned out to be really dirty, they they had different stains and everything, and they turned on me and they told me that. So you look down on us, let's look at your clothes. And it was all clean, so. <laughs> now, properties of black light. Black light, this is one of the misconceptions. You have to deal with the misconceptions. I like CSI shows. They, get, they got kids engaged. But the problem is that they also create misconceptions out of nowhere. They can see, they, they think that they can just use black light to look for blood stains. Not gonna work. Not gonna, you, have, you need to use special cameras. You can't really do that. So, in the TV shows, they just have the black light go over and voila, everything is right there. Not gonna happen. What you can come up with is what you can use it for is Samuel Fu we can't we can really do that since we're high school, but I guess in college you can go ahead and do that, but not in high school. But saliva, <laughs> urine, and again, bone and teeth, that's one of the important parts. You can, act, you can also see uh, the various clothing, the various fiber fragments. So when you, tr when you start passing it all around your body, you can look at the fibers, different fibers, and you, you would see that some of them light up <coughs> under black light. Some of them don't, but some of them do. So you can see the fragment, uh, the piece of fiber that you can see with naked eye. That's really good for that. Now, what I want you guys to focus on the teeth, because teeth is, like we all know, it's just a bone. So you can pick up traces of bones and teeth, and it all lights up. And this was in total darkness, so the only thing you can see, it was really creepy. The only thing you can see was their teeth. <laughs> all right. Now. This was the second experiment, hair analysis. There are two parts of hair analysis. First, they make a cross-examination of human and animal hair. So for them, that was kind of gross because we had bat hair, rat hair, possum. Sheep and rabbit are fine, they're cute, but rat and bats were, they were gross. So, um, there are two, well, we couldn't really do the hair toxicology, 
Okay. Because I mean, you gotta have really, really advanced instrument for it. We don't have that in our. I mean, even some universities don't have that. But the good part is that I told them with hair toxicology, your parents can pick up pieces of your hair on your comb, and they can just go to your lab, mm -hmm. have people look at them, mm -hmm. and then they can actually tell what you, what month you started using those, mm -hmm. and they can actually tell that um, what kind of drug that you're on. So there is no way of hiding that. That was scary for some people. <laughs> <laughs> the only analysis that we could do was, was microscopic analysis, and they were looking at traces. With this, I haven't really given them any um, patterns. It was just go look at them, tell me what you're seeing, draw it, and try to explain it to the rest of the class. But in the second part, that's when they started looking at patterns. What I, what I mean by patterns is you have different parts of hair, cuticle, medulla, and you have straight, curvy hair, and there's actually one hair type which was scientifically called kinky, so that was kind of funny, <laughs> high point, highlight of the class. And after that, what they did is that they took a part of a friend's hair, prepared a slide, which apparently they haven't done before, so I had to show them how they can prepare the slide with just nail polish. I'm sorry, nail polish remover. And they prepared their own hair example, numbered it, and after they, they started numbering it, they put it under the microscope this body cam. It took him about an hour or so to figure it out. I haven't helped him. So I told him, figure it out, here's the software and everything. And apparently he hadn't used it before, and most of the time what they do, they just have the kids look into the microscope, their eyes get tired, they have glasses on, they can't really see it, and they take turns, they try to take turns, it, it just takes time. Mm -hmm. So this software, it was really, really good. And as you can look at it, so when you look at hair, analysis, if the hair is hollow, mm -hmm. then it tells you something, it tells you you might have someone with white hair or blonde hair. Mm -hmm. And we had only one Asian kid in our class, and this was her hair, perfect hair. Mm -hmm. No hollow, nothing, it was just full, thick, like you can't see anything through. Mm -hmm. But with other students, with special kids with blonde hair, you can actually see the patterns and everything. It's easier. So that told them, that showed them that, just by looking at the hair, you can tell someone's race. Mm -hmm. All right. Fiber analysis, now forensic science classifies hair as fiber, but I didn't prefer to use that because it just be, makes everything um, so confusing. I mean, when, when, when we talk about fiber in daily life, <coughs> we mean clothing, I mean, we don't talk about our, our hair as fiber. We don't prefer that. So. I told them clothing is fiber, hair is something else. So make a distinguish. Alright, so fiber analysis. Fiber analysis got boy, that's boring. <coughs> I gotta tell that's for fiber analysis because they're looking at something, they say, eh, okay, this is spandex. Mm, uh -huh. This is cotton. Mm, this is something. But it's kind of boring. So um, I bought this kit, this kind of evidence. It is a made up it's a made-up case about Lyle and Lewis, but the case was really prepared good, and the kids, they got engaged right away. They got hooked on right away. You can go ahead and purchase those. I mean, they have different, same case, but different, hair, different analysis of the same case. So what happens is that you open up the kit, and you have this evidence coming from different local PDs. So these people, they're, like there's some, um, drugs, sex included, like someone, like, they, they can't really tell who the father is. <laughs> but that was really, really good. I mean, that was really good. Then, then, what happened is that they live in Texas, they flee into New Mexico, the straight trooper stops them, then they gotta uh, investigate different hay, uh, hair and fiber like small fragments, and they need to find who the killer might be. So all the evidence private, uh, provided, you just look, look at those underneath the microscope and you gotta tell who the killer is. And we had different groups of people against, um, um, racing against each other, and each group tried to tell who the murderer is. So that was really good. 
All right. Now, um, this crime scene investigator part, this is what you would see again in crime shows most of the time. So it was loosely based on this Georgia teen's team mm -hmm. death in 2013. I'm sure you've seen the video. Like they roll him up in GMAT and they found his body and it turned out that someone was actually um, troops to the school tried to cover it up but they couldn't do it. The local PD got involved, the FBI got involved, it was just nasty. <coughs> now, I haven't given them the specifics of the case mm -hmm. but some of them were, was already aware of the case so they just, uh, I just told them we have a case, a kid dies in gym so let's try to make a crime scene where it looks like a real case and you get to collect the evidence. What they do, you divide them into groups, some of them becomes the deputies, some of them becomes the photographer, some of them becomes the, um, the, sh um, the chief who comes in, asks for briefing and everything, and you have, let's say you have one of the officers standing literally just next to the tape for hours, just logging in, whoever comes in, whoever crosses over and logging out. They have to sign that. So this was actually a real, uh, real deal when you think about the uh, crime scene investigation. All right, this was one of the experiments that I've done in the last month. So ABO and RH system blood typing. So I tr tried to go over the biology curriculum and I saw that our biology teachers in the Harmony system and I'm going to show you two websites that you can look at. You can go look at it. So those websites they include um, all the hands-on ex experiments and activities that teachers are doing in Harmony System. They put everything in there. So if you want to do an experiment, you can just go look at the pictures and you can look at the explanation and figure it out for yourself. But if you want to call someone up, they, that's one of the good parts about working for Harmony. You want to you want to do something. There's someone in, down in Houston or in Dallas who've done that before, you call them up, send them an email, and most of the time they're willing to help you out, and you can find that person just looking at the pictures. So, I look at the biology teachers, what I've seen was that they had the kids do blood typing, mm -hmm. but they use synthetic blood. Mm -hmm. Now, synthetic blood, you get the same result, but it is not really a daily life application, because they're not going to get synthetic blood, they're going to get real blood. So, I thought, I should come up with something where they actually find find out their own blood type. So there's this thing called Alden cards, um, which was invented by a Finnish scientist about 45 years ago. So Alden cards, what they do is that they come up with antigens and everything, but you gotta keep them in deep in deep freeze to keep the antigens fresh, and you need to use them after in six months after opening up the package. So. What we did is that um, since they are not trained in medical science, so they didn't know how to prick their fingers, so I talked to our nurse, who's a certified nurse, and she told me that she would help us. So she came up to the class, she had them in a line, and one by one she pricked their fingers like this. After that, they gotta do the rest because blood is coming out. But so what they do, they have four sticks, they, they, they take four samples, put them there, and after putting the samples, we stitch them up, put everything together, just take that stitch. <laughs> it's not something I picked up watching the sessions. So they put everything back on there, and then they go sit there with their group partners, and they turn it upside down like this, right hand side, left hand side, and they wait until the blood coagulates, and if the blood coagulates, that you don't block in that certain type, and if the, if it does not co coagulate, then you belong to that certain type. And this pamphlets, they were really helpful because you just look at the pictures, do a cross-reference examination, so that, that was actually, that turned out better than I early anticipated. Oh, um, yeah, let me talk about that too. Why is this related to forensic science? Because you're out on the scene, you got like 20 people who might be your suspects, 
what they do is that they have, if they have a blood trace or blood evidence, they look at it, they found out what blood type it is, and they line up those people just like we did, take their blood types, and look at them because you can't really trust, some, uh, trust someone when they say I have be positive and, and they're suspects. So you can't really do that. So they have to do this on site. So that's why this related to real law enforcement practice. Now, once we started examining the blood, everything just became more fun out of nowhere because apparently um, they like blood. <laughs> um, they love blood. So uh, what we did and what we are going to do today is the liminal analysis. And I'm sure you have seen it on CSI mm -hmm. show that they go like this and they have a black bag on. Now, you don't need a black bag. It'll just it just eliminates by itself. So, mm -hmm. what I have done is uh, I have contacted some people in the local um, uh, one of the uh, supermarkets. They brought us uh, beef blood that they had because what they, they chop them, they chop up the steaks, and they have a drain which just takes the water and the blood. Mm -hmm. And so they brought in a small cup, which was enough. So what you do, you just spray it all around this class, literally, all around the class, and then <coughs> the part, you take a seat and make them clean it. <laughs> and I thought they would hate it, but they actually like cleaning blood. I guess it's not an experience you get to do every day, so I just gave them regular water bottle, and they started cleaning up the blood, and since it was beef blood, they were, like, everybody was okay with it. But well, once you start with pig blood and real human blood, so that's, so that's out of question, and you can't really do that. Beef blood was okay. So they cleaned it. We waited two days. After waiting two days, I made the room total dark, total darkness. And now I tried it before. I tried this test before, but even I was surprised with the results. Because what was so surprising is that you see her going in circles, mm -hmm. you could see the circles. Uh -huh. So you would know that someone was cleaning like, and he tried to clean it upside down. You could see the tracks going upside down. And it, it, and it was like two days later, the cleaning lady came in, she cleaned everything. I mean, we had classes coming and going, the trace evidence was still there. And apparently, it stays on the scene of to nine years. That I didn't know. Well, I learned it when I was studying the examination. So nine years. You have blood stain there, it's going to stay there nine years. So, and now this was about chemistry because why the reason you have this illuminating blood is because the oxidizing, this is an actually a good, really good oxidizer. So it oxidizes, it oxidizes the chemicals in the blood and when you have oxidation, you would have electrons getting exciting, jumping up and down. And when they start from jump from one energy level to the next one, they release the energy. And that energy we see, the emit the light, that we see as a light, perceive as a light. So blood analysis, it was also about, I actually thought about doing it here, but it's really um, hard to clean up. What you do is that you find a container and you fill it up blood, but fake blood, you fill it up You fill it up with fake blood, then you go to just smash it, like a criminal with the innocent mm -hmm. man. So just smash it. And if you have high velocity, you will have different um, pattern. And if you have low velocity, if you have a blunt force trauma, then um, the patterns change. And if they go in 90 degree angle, they change. If they go directly down to the ground with force of gravity, pattern changes. That made them um, remember what they learned in physics in their junior year, because in order to understand high velocity, low velocity impact, you got to use your physics. There's no way around it. So this had them the uh, long for trauma and patterns. That that had them related to physics and blood analysis, biology, and the chemistry was the chemistry part was oxidizing. And engine uh, technology part, I've really not 
got into engineering so far, but the technology part was using the software for microscopic analysis. Now, I haven't gone into math integration yet. That would be the last of my slides. All right, now, uh, producing synthetic or fake blood, this actually felt like cooking class. So, this actually felt like cooking class. When I started, I started looking for how to make synthetic blood in class, I thought, like, should I do it first or show them? Or should I let them do it, just give the recipe and let them figure it out? Because that's one of the challenges as a science teacher that I face every day. You have an awesome experiment, an awesome demonstration, and if you do it, I feel sometimes it, it feels like what I think what my mom did when she was dealing with me. If now if she does it, it'll just get done right away. But if she hasn't done it, mm -hmm. then I'm gonna nag, <laughs> I'm gonna whine, and it'll take a few days for me to get it done completely. So as a teacher. I, also, I, I mean, you always face that. I'm sure you've gone through that. You always face that. And I always need to remind myself, you're not their parent. You're only facilitator. Make them do the work. They will whine. They will say, I don't get this. They will even say, I'm stupid, mister. I can't do this. But just, you got to push them. Because if you, let, if you do the experiment for them, then they're not learning anything. And the worst part is, they graduate, I had that last year, they graduate, then you would hear people, they would talk behind your back, they would say, well, Mr. Gocek didn't really have us do anything. <laughs> or Mr. Blah 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 didn't really have us anything. He just did all the work, and we got the grades. So even that, that, that really hurts, I mean, because you want, you want the kids to appreciate your hard work. So I came up with a like, strict rule, don't do the work. I always went, don't do the work, don't do the work, let them do the work. Okay, why am I buying here? So, the ingredients, uh, the recipe, if you ever want to do this, because this is an experiment you can do with middle, even with middle schoolers. Um, this, ex, uh, this one was really easy, and the recipe is, um, you, I will show you how you can reach your recipe if you ever want to do it. So, recipe is um, red food coloring. I mean, obviously. That's for the coloring, red food coloring. And you, we, would, we had corn syrup, just clear corn syrup. You can buy all of these ingredients in Walmart. Corn syrup, it was for the texture and consistency, more, more like consistency. And we had cornstarch, and cornstarch was for texture. So you don't want to have a liquid that's too watery, because that's what you get with corn syrup. Then you have the cornstarch. It becomes more of real. More, it feel. It starts feeling like more like blood. So that was really good. And that was something interesting too, which I really found fascinating. They actually have you add some cocoa powder. The reason is that human blood is iron, but not regular iron. Iron oxide. Iron oxide is we all know it's just rust. So we have rust in our blood, and we all know rust looks brownish. So your blood, our blood, is not perfect. Red. It has some brownish stain. So in order to reach that, you add some cocoa, cocoa powder, to make it a little bit of um, rusty. And that was it. I mean, that was really simple. But what we needed for a better um, mixture was a blender. And thanks God, we had blender in lab. So they used they used the blender to come up with the perfect mixture. And I had them separated into four groups. And in four groups, what they did is that they raced, again, they were racing against each other, and they were graded based on how good their blood looked like. And I, I recruited help from one of our teachers. She, she was actually teaching math, but um, she was also, she also liked to go hunting. Mm -hmm. So in her own words, she said this, now we had five different cups, and she said, not this one, this what comes out of deal when I shoot it. So, she was our expert <laughs> helping me to decide which one actually looked like blood. All right. All right. And we will use that in blood spatter analysis. Uh, what you do in blood spatter analysis, yeah, it's really simple. You have this uh, white big black tissue paper, just, it has to be a corner. You cover a whole corner, 
like this, then you will have one or two students wearing up that white suit that you will see in TV, like completely white. So they wear the suit, they put the goggles on, and they go smash. But they can't smash like crazy because it doesn't really help. So they need to do first low velocity, then, then high velocity, the end you also have to cover the ceiling too because if you have a bat then you try to hurt someone innocent, you go bash it at them, you try to take it out, then some of the blood will go to the ceiling. So you gotta see that too. You gotta know how to interpret that too. And there's if you haven't seen Gun Girl there, you see the Gun Girl, there's actually something related to that. Because what they did, they the investigator, she sees a trace of blood on the ceiling because most of the time people ignore the ceiling since it's so far away. So that was what you would get if you smash someone and you take it out really fast, that's what you would get. All right. All right, integrated forensic science with math. Boy, math, everybody hates math. And <laughs> integrating forensic science with math is so far that the, that presents the highest challenge I mean. because you want to integrate the math somewhere then they go they all go crazy I hate math so I had to go slow about integrating the math and again thanks God blood helped me and what they what I had them do they calculated chances of finding out a certain blood type in US population and how is that how's how does that relate to forensic science when you have a suspect list of 100 students in a frat house, then you got to narrow that list down. I mean. So what they do, again, they say there's 20% of, uh, we got the blood type, it's HB positive, uh, AB positive, and that means, and how do we see that in regular US population, AB positive is here, so it's 0.95%, 0.95%, no one wants to have that, that's really bad. So 0.95% of the population will have AB positive, so that means if your suspect has the same blood type or your, if your um, a trace of the suspect has the same blood type, then you have a very high chance of finding that guy because you will only have one or two people in your campus. Um, but, all right. And they have to choose a, a favorite blood type and you got to present it to make the rest of the school so that they will get excited. All right. Next, I also teach physics like I told you. In physics, we have something called STEM SOS model. The Harmony is um, uh, preparing a book on it. This is the first page of the book, the cover. And you can judge this book by its color. It looks good. Um, this is the pool that I go to to look at the experiments that everybody else is doing to catch up with them. So, um, that one, I liked it. And I will integrate this model into forensic science next week. That's the next week, next year. That's what I'm planning on. So they will create they, they will create a website, videos about the experiments that they're doing. So this is gonna be one of the good parts. And if you ever wanna look at the pictures in detail, learn about the experiments in, the, in detail, the recipes and everything, this is my Google Plus account. Uh, this is my Facebook page, so you can those and I will share the slide I will share the slide with in Google Plus and Facebook so if you ever want to look at the slide again you will be able to see the link here and here so if there's any questions I'll let me go back and make it alright can I turn on the lights sure alright so you have your bad guy you have a crime scene, you got all the blood, and you've seen the CSI show. So you know that if you ever use bleach, that you can positively remove the trace evidence. You can remove the DNA, you, you can remove the DNA, but you can't remove the trace. So I'm going to show you guys how to, how to do it. So this is just regular bleach. You spray it out like this. And uh, let me make a shape for you. So I'm trying to clean it, clean it, clean it, clean it, clean it, clean it, clean it. So I cleaned it. I'm going to wipe off my hands. Again, this will leave a trace. Show them you're wiping your hands. Then you went on with your day. You waited a few weeks. Uh, it's still there. 
now. I will show you how it's there, and I will show you why those CSI shows are not accurate. So, the black light, mm -hmm. the key, <laughs> <laughs> and the stains. <laughs> so, I will have this go around. Right? Right. Again, I'm going to try the black light. Nothing. So, they lie. Nothing. Let me turn this off. Then, I have my lim liminal. I have my liminal. <laughs> All right, now I want you guys to look closely. Wow. So, do you all see the pattern? Yeah. And how I wiped off my hands? Yeah. So, and I used the liminal, I let it dry, I come back another day, still. The worst part is you try to take a picture of this god, I hated it. Because it doesn't show on regular really regular camera you gotta have really expensive equipment to see that and the one of the fun things you can do at the liminal I couldn't take pictures of it due to the nature of the experiment we went into the bathrooms made sure everybody was out <laughs> <laughs> because they gotta see the urine how it lights up under your liminal so we had the, we went into the bathrooms make sure everybody was made sure everybody was out and turn off the light turn off the lights and then I wonder and they were going, ew, there's a real there because you could see the urine coming down next to the ball and you can see the spatters of how boys and girls' bathrooms are different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, spatter all around the place. <laughs> Not a clean place to be. <laughs> Alright, thank you guys. <laughs>